So what I'd like to do today is kind of go through a little bit of background in the litigation funding arena, then kind of talk about how our panelists approach that and what are the changes and evolving trends in the space. And I'd like this to be interactive, so if at any time you have a question, please raise your hand as opposed to waiting till the end. I think that allows you to ask timely questions uh, as opposed to making a list of them in the end. So I will uh, turn it over to the panel to uh, introduce themselves, tell us a little bit about their background, how they found themselves in the litigation funding space, and make a note or two about uh, what their views are um, of the litigation industry completely open on that side. So what, David, why don't we sure. start with you? Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. My name is Dave Kirstein, and I am an investment manager and legal counsel at Bentham IMF uh, in New York. Uh, prior to coming to Bentham about two and a half years ago, I was a litigator for 15 years, uh, most of that time uh, at uh, Gibson Dunn and Crutcher in New York. I was a commercial litigator kind of spanning uh, the realm of uh, litigation topics. Uh, I actually sort of bumped into this industry accidentally about uh, six years ago in 2011 when I was litigating the Chevron Ecuador matter uh, on behalf of Chevron and in the course of that litigation we discovered that uh, the, our adversary there, the plaintiffs, was being funded by, by Burford and uh, the whole notion that there was this industry called litigation finance was, was a shock to me and, and a very interesting one and, and that's uh, sort of how I ended up here. Uh, real quickly my thoughts on the industry. I still describe it as a nascent industry, but it is growing by leaps and bounds literally you know, every day as far as I can tell. Uh, and it's really uh, gaining adoption in the U.S. market at least pretty quickly amongst uh, big law and bigger corporations uh, almost every day. Uh, I'm Emily Slater. I'm a director at Burford Capital. Um, I am currently the head of new business development and um, for the six years, I took that job on about a month ago. For six years, I was one of the lead underwriters at Burford, um, investing and managing um, um, investments that we were making over time. Um, I was a litigator for nine years at Depot Boys and Plimpton. Prior to joining Burford, I did a really broad range of litigation, um, commercial litigation, bankruptcy, um, fiduciary duty, and a fair amount of white collar um, defense and investigation work. Um, and, um, you know, I've been in the industry for about six years, and it has gone from people wondering what it was when, when I said I was, I was leaving litigation, to leaving Deborah Voice to go to a litigation funder to um, being really on the, the hot topic on, of discussion at, at many, many conferences and on everybody's um, interest list. So I think it's a growing industry. We are just scratching the surface in terms of um, what we can do for law firms and for um, companies and um, and we're excited to continue to evolve, uh, evolve evolve the industry over time hi good afternoon my name is Michael Weiss I have been in the litigation finance industry since 2009 my partners and I have put out close to a billion dollars across the spectrum we have invested both in the consumer pre-settlement business as well as law firm finance, commercial case finance. We've also founded the only federally chartered bank in America, which is catered to the plaintiff law, Esquire Bank. Most recently, I founded a company called Yield Street. The premise of Yield Street is to be a marketplace for accredited investors to get access to asset-based lending investment opportunities. Litigation finance is our biggest asset class to date. In less than two years, we've done almost $70 million on the platform across all those asset classes that I mentioned. I think um, similar to what Emily had just touched on, the industry has definitely evolved substantially since I started. I remember being embarrassed to tell people that I finance litigation. They would be like, this guy's crazy, he's a gambler. Over time, I think that the industry evolves. There are more, there's more capital than there's ever been before. Um, and I think that we're still at the early stages of the industry being able to help law firms in more ways than we thought we would early on. And I think that law firms and corporations today are seeing the value of litigation funders as a way to expand their businesses and make them more profitable entities because it seems that the practice of law or the business of law 
isn't really sustainable just on the hourly front. And companies like ours with the investment initiatives that we have across this panel are helping those businesses and law firms really evolve and, and become better businesses. And I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more soon. Um, thanks, uh, everyone, for, for having me. My name is uh, Jim Little. And um, since about 2008, I've uh, run a series of funds called Drumcliff. Um, we're a little bit specialized in the uh, litigation funding industry in that we only um, take on claims that involve some degree of collection risk. Um, so we sort of look at the um, market as having uh, sort of three uh, areas of, of liability. I guess it's proving liability, figuring out what the damages are, and then actually collecting on a judgment. Um, we found in our sort of small neck of the woods in the litigation funding industry that there are a lot of um, recalcitrant debtors uh, who are uh, judgment debtors for money judgments. Um, we finance a lot of victims of fraud, um, which has a lot of overlap with the insolvency process. Uh, and we also fund uh, sovereigns who have fallen prey to uh, corruption um, in their efforts to be able to repatriate assets for, uh, for their people. Um, it's uh, a bit of an offshoot of uh, investing in uh, straight commercial disputes, but um, I think like everyone else in the panel said, it's um, also an expanding industry. Uh, unfortunately, uh, fraud and corruption and um, recalcitrant debtors are sort of uh, thriving and alive and well, and the problem seems to um, be uh, only exacerbated by uh, globalization. And um, like, uh, like everyone else said, I feel like we're, um, the analogy I use is we're, we're sort of in the second hour of the litigation funding day. So um, we, I, I, in my own view, I feel like the, uh, the industry itself is, um, people understand the value that litigation funding um, provides in the right circumstances. Um, there's still a lot of um, figuring out about the best ways to use it and, uh, and how to use it efficiently. Um, but um, after a lot of um, growing pains, I think, since we've all been involved in the industry, which was, it seems like it just cropped up in about 2007, 2008, um, I think we've ironed out a lot of those problems in the industry, and um, you know, it, I think it'll only expand over time. Thank you. I'd like to get a little bit more granular about the actual types of cases that you all take on. And, and so if I could ask you guys to give a case example, even on a no-names no basis, um, so that our, uh, our audience um, can see how this process works. And if you can, in, in, as part of your um, response, talk about how you intake cases a bit, the type of due diligence or, or not that, that you might engage in, and um, how you've seen the, that mix of cases change since you um, first entered the, um, the business. Emily, why don't we start with you? Sure. Um, go. Um, so I can just, I think, maybe talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts of how litigation funding works. I still find it, um, when I talk to lawyers and, and business people all the time, that it's a buzzword, but they don't quite understand. Um, how it works in practice, and maybe I'll talk about that, and then Dave can talk a little bit about the diligence process. Um, the basic concept of litigation funding um, is that a litigation is a contingent asset. It needs some investment in order for it to come to fruition, um, and litigation finance provides capital to um, pay for legal fees and expenses that are necessary to <clears throat> litigate a case and get it all the way to the finish line. It is typically provided on a non-recourse basis to the litigant, um, and, um, and the, re the funder receives in return um, a portion of the proceeds that are that are generated from the from the litigation from a successful litigation. If the litigation is not successful, the funder gets nothing back. Um, so that is that is the basic concept of it. And we have, as the um, industry has evolved from what we would probably call that now kind of a classic single case litigation funding investment, where you have one case, a litigation fi uh, funder provides. Uh, legal fees and expenses for that one case and is dependent on one generally very binary outcome, either the case wins or loses. Um, and we have um, taken that from doing those deals directly with claimants to doing multi-case deals with claimants that have a series of litigations and we provide a pool of capital uh, for those litigants to apply as necessary across those cases and we get a predetermined return from the pool. And some cases might win, some cases might lose, and we get a, a return across the pool. 
um, and also uh, capital to corporations uh, for large groups of cases and, um, and to law firms um, that we provide non-recourse investments to the firms across a, a single case or even a large pool of cases. Um, so that's the basic concept. Um, there's a lot more interesting and esoteric kind of investing that's happening now, but um, th that's the sort of your classic litigation funding, and I will turn it over to Dave to talk a little bit more about how we look at cases. Sure. Uh, that, was, that was great, Emily. I'd, I'd say the one thing I would add to the, the uses of our funding besides for legal fees and costs, uh, more and more our, our funding is used for operating or working capital of mm -hmm. businesses that are involved in litigation might not be able to survive the life of the litigation without the infusion of capital or as, as Emily's uh, firm uh, recently uh, publicized sort of uh, what I would call monetizing an appeal a judgment uh, prior to an appeal allowing uh, someone who has a judgment a trustee in bankruptcy for example to take some money off the table and use the resources to fund other things that trustee might do want to do while the appeal is pending and, and that's another uh, use of our funds um, we really fund cases all across uh, the commercial spectrum uh, at Bentham. We're usually looking to deploy at least a million or a million and a half. Some folks' thresholds might be a little higher at, at, other, at other funds. Uh, and, and the top end is, is somewhat unlimited. Uh, the wheelhouse of what we like to fund is usually about five to $15 million in a single case. And we also fund portfolios as well. And we're usually looking to see that the uh, the value of the case, what you could really settle it for or return a reasonable judgment that's collected is going to be about 8 to 10x of whatever we're being asked to commit uh, to the case, and I don't think that's uh, that different across the industry as well. Um, usually when a case will come to us, we will do a quick intake of it to see if it generally hits our parameters, uh, and if it does, we'll uh, immediately ask the, the, the client or the lawyer on behalf of the client to sign up in an NDA. And then we'll do a bit of a deeper dive into what the case is about, what some of the strengths or weaknesses are, look at some key documents, uh, speak to the lawyers and the client. We want to meet the lawyers and the client in person. Um, and, and generally within about a week or so of that initial uh, look at the case, uh, if it's something that we want to pursue, we will propose a non-binding term sheet to the client that sets out the proposed financial arrangements going forward. If we can reach agreement on that term sheet, the one piece of it that's binding is we ask for a period of exclusivity usually about 30 to 45 days, uh, where we, that, that part is binding because we spend a lot of money, time, and effort uh, doing a deep dive into the diligence of the case, really kicking the tires pretty heavily. The investments are all non-recourse. We're only getting a return if the case is successful. So we want to make sure that we're going to be investing in a case that's highly likely to be successful. Um, and during that diligence process, we'll usually look at um, who the claimant is, who the lawyers are, uh, what the, the value of the case is, the strengths and weaknesses of the, the underlying merits, and who the defendant is and whether the case uh, may or may not be uh, collectible. So it, it looked like you had a question over there. Yeah, sorry, that's a very good question. Emily described litigation as a, as a contingent asset. Um, are, are we talking there, Emily, about the claimant funding and litigation? Because obviously litigation can be a contingent liability. Yes. Um, I would say that generally, um, you know, the, the, mo the by far the most capital is being used to fund claimant claims now, but certainly I would say the holy grail out there for both law firms and litigants and funders is to do defense side funding um, where we are providing finance for litigation, um, defense side litigation, and structuring essentially defense side contingency. Um, and that is something we look at routinely. Uh, Burford had an investment, a uh, public one, um, with Grant Thornton, um, where we, we uh, provided capital for a group of uh, litigations that were being prosecuted by an insolvency uh, practitioner at, at Grant Thornton, and it, it went across um, declaratory cases, defense side cases, and some affirmative litigation. So it can be applied across any kind of litigation. It's a little bit harder to structure a defense side deal, but it is absolutely something that we are looking at and doing and, and working very hard to, to really um, figure out how to perfect. Yeah. If I could just add sure. one thing to that as well. Uh, yeah, I agree with that. The bulk of what we do right now and look at our plaintiff side cases, but we do uh, look at, as uh, Emily had mentioned and thought a lot about, defense side funding. Uh, and there, there's probably two different ways to do it. One is sort of like a, a reverse contingency, as Emily mentioned. And the second way, as Emily also mentioned, is to sort of package 
plaintiff and defense side cases together, where in a sense you're using the plaintiff side cases if they're finance. valuable enough to finance the defense side cases. Right. Let me ask you a follow up, David, before we turn uh, over to uh, Jim and, and Michael. Where do your cases come from, and do you guys have any parameters on who your um, clients are? In other words, are you funding individuals um, in personal injury cases, or are these major companies in complex or somewhere in between? So two parts of that. I think the, the, the bulk of the best cases that we end up investing in really come through trusted law firm connections. Um, but more and more these days, um, and I'm sure this is the same for, for Burford as well, we're getting direct contact from clients or lawyers, and especially sort of CFO types or savvy general counsels or CEOs of public and private companies who are coming to us directly, often before they have a law firm attached to the case, or maybe they have the wrong law firm attached to the case. And um, so we're getting good cases that come to us directly as well. Uh, at Bentham, at least, we generally consider ourselves to be commercial funders, meaning that we fund all sorts of commercial litigations, and sometimes it's easier to say what we don't fund. We d usually don't fund, at least on a single case basis, personal injury, medical malpractice, attorney malpractice, or class actions, although those, those kind of cases can be part of portfolios that we might fund. Yeah, and, and Burford has generally the similar um, parameters. We do commercial litigation um, and, um, and cases come from, from everywhere. Um, I think we also do a fair amount of um, looking for um, opportunities, paying close attention to what's happening in the litigation space and what we think is coming next, um, and working with firms that we have uh, good relationships with and clients um, to help them see where the next, um, next opportunities are coming. Thank you. Jim, tell us about the process and referral sources and originations at Drumcliff. Uh, sure. So um, we're a bit unique in that, first of all, we, we do not do any defense side work. It's uh, because we deal with collection risk, most of the people on the other side of the equation um, are, are not the most reputable people. I think and they're, you know, they're doing a lot of asset protection work. Um, because either they're not paying a judgment or they've stolen money or they've committed a fraud. Um, so we, uh, just as a matter of personal principle, we, we don't help those people out. Um, but uh, by the same token... Not all defendants are fraud. <laughs> well, that's, you know, we don't deal with commercial disputes, so it's not, if two people want to have a healthy argument, that's Fraudsters. fine. But I like to think that our, it's easier for us to do underwriting sometimes on these claims when we know that the person who's on the other side of the civil claim also um, is, uh, has a criminal claim against them. It kind of gives us a, a higher ground. Yes. This is just, yes, just in my true. neck of the woods. That's absolutely right. Um, uh, by the same token, uh, when we, um, because of the nature of, of uh, fraud and, um, and judgment debt and corruption, um, I, and my colleagues and I have described our uh, sort of uh, process of looking for investments as sort of waiting for lightning to strike. Um, because you're not really going to know if there's a claim to be had unless uh, the wire transfer doesn't hit 30 days after they um, agree to a settlement or until a corrupt administration comes uh, out of office and the new administration comes in and realizes that the treasury is empty uh, or if there's a bankruptcy uh, that occurs on a lar for a large company and uh, the trustee is appointed and realizes that there isn't any money in the bank account. Um, we don't know where that's going to occur, um, but we do have some, some preferences uh, similar to the same sort of economic underwriting standards that Emily uh, and Dave and Mike have, which is basically um, because it costs a lot of money either to litigate or, uh, you know, in our, um, in our field to uh, pay for investigators and forensic accountants as well as, as litigators, um, we just simply can't go after claims of a certain size um, because it costs the same amount of money um, to, to litigate over um, $10,000 as it does to litigate over uh, $15 million, let's say. So uh, 10 to $15 million in putative debts is usually the minimum amount of um, sort of, um, it's the economic threshold um, that will, uh, where we'll look at an investment, as, as Dave said, sort of in that initial review to figure out if, um, if our uh, financing can make sense just from an economic standpoint, both for us uh, and for the claimants. Um, I also have a personal rule where we um, don't take a majority of any proceeds in any claim. Um, only uh, the reason why is because uh, we feel that the restitution should be, um, should be for the claimants themselves. And um, just for my own reputation, I wouldn't want to be making money at the expense of victims of fraud because they have a lot of other emotional um, problems and, and things that they have to deal with um, in, that, in that environment. Um, so uh, that just means that a claim probably has to be a larger size until we're willing to take a look at it. 
Thank you. There was a question from the gentleman in the back. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And when we talk about litigation, I think we mean both litigation in courts and arbitrations. Yeah. Yeah. Legal finance. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Same with that. We look at international and domestic arbitrations equally with with uh, litigation. I might go so far as to say that you know litigation, funding, and finance in terms uh, of what we're talking about encompasses. Uh, any investment of, of capital that has disputes internationally mm -hmm. or any aspect of disputes at its as a collateral in some shape or fashion. Dispute funding. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also judgment enforcement. Yes, and judgment funding. enforcement. Michael, we're really interested to hear from you about how you go about it because you have a very unique approach. Sounds very successful. Sure. So I, uh, I kind of tripped on this space in 2009 where there was a particular hedge fund that was financing a lot of law firms and coming out of the credit cycle, they were no longer able to provide financing to one of their borrowers and that was kind of my entrance into the space. So we don't look at a specific area of legal finance or litigation funding. We've looked at legal finance as a business, a business of law, so to speak. And over the years, the strategies where we place capital has evolved. Um, I think across the board what we really look at is betting on the jockey. We don't do binary risk for the most part unless it's incredibly compelling. We have invested across pre-settlement finance, class action, you know, settlements or preliminary settlements where there is a period of time where there are commercial businesses that are party to some sort of class or mass action that have been involved for a long time waiting to monetize those claims. They need to still be in business. They need capital. We can come in and finance those claims or acquire those claims. Um, law firm loans is a big portion of our business, and we do that across a variety of type of firms. So we've done that in commercial litigation, so top 50 law firms in the world. We look at portfolios of complex business litigation or other types of litigation. We underwrite them on a portfolio basis, and we're typically structured as first money out, and then we have some sort of sharing beyond that. Um, we finance firms that have asset recovery components to them. We are very large um, financiers in the mass tort space through multiple entities of ours across the entire strategy. So anything from advertising to medical record acquisition, plaintiff fact sheets, there's a lot of expenses that go into processing these mass torts and we're very involved in that. Um, and on a very infrequent basis, we'll look at binary risk, complex commercial litigation or patent litigation. Um, our business has always been, like I said, to bet on the jockey. The process that um, was explained by my colleagues here is very similar to the process that we employ as well. I would say one thing with regards to our due diligence is we have always believed not in hiring a team of experts or lawyers in-house. We always felt that outsourcing that would give us a better ability to look at as many possible business opportunities. So as opposed to building you know, 10 all-star names that have certain expertise in-house at a very high cost to operate, we can have judges or lawyers or other experts in different areas where, depending on the opportunity that we're looking at, we'll hire them as a third-party consultant. So we operate the same way. We take an initial review. We kind of have a good sense of what we like to do. If it's something we're interested in, we'll get back to you really quickly, put out a term sheet. If we can agree on economic terms, we'll take a deposit usually, then we'll bring on a third party expert to do diligence on that particular claim type or legal area that we're funding. And we take the process from there. So the rest of you. Do you guys do more credit analysis of your counterparties as part of your analysis, or is it mostly case focused? It's mostly case focused. The only credit side analysis that we do is Sometimes we found in the past that people get tripped up when they provide financing. They enable a firm to take on more cases. They build a warehouse of cases. Now they have to hire more people. Their operating expenses go through the roof. 
and all of a sudden they show back up and say, hey, great news, we have all these cases, bad news, we can't pay for them, the lights are going out, we need another 10 million bucks. Yeah. So the credit analysis that we do is simply to understand that the business could continue to operate or mm -hmm. the firm could continue to operate. We always say we want to make sure that, you know, come five days before the month, you have a new deposit in the account, you're operating, go out, make your money, process your cases, do your thing. Don't worry about the business expenses. So that's the extent of our credit analysis. Thank you. Let's turn our focus a bit to, to how this industry is impacting the way um, litigation is handled and by whom and what obstacles are there. It might surprise you to know that this is a multi-billion dollar industry already in terms of monies that are invested in matters and judgments and dispute related claims around the world. It might also surprise you to know that that is just a fraction of what um, this industry is capable of. And the other aspect of this, um, which I'm aware of, that I'd like to share with you is that the returns that these entities are providing to their investors are higher than what you would ordinarily see from similarly sized hedge funds, private equity funds, or crowdsourcing funds. And so my question to the panel is, how much appetite, number one, do you see in the marketplace for the services you're providing from investors? And where do you see the size of the industry growing? And then we'll get into what that means for the way companies and law firms operate. Sure. I guess uh, one word answer, the short answer to that is, is large or large appetite. Um, we get approached all the time by folks looking to uh, invest in us. Uh, up until about a month ago, a month and a half ago, all of our capital at Bentham had come from the permanent capital of our shareholders. In the U.S., we are the wholly owned subsidiary of our parent company, which is a public company traded on the Australian Stock Exchange. So our capital came from, from the shareholders, from, from doing some bond offerings uh, every once in a while. But in the U.S., as we've grown in the U.S., we opened in the U.S. about six years ago, and every year we've added, we've become 10% greater of our overall company's portfolio. We were eating up a lot of the public company's capital, and we needed more capital for, for all the opportunities we were seeing here in the U.S. And so we went out in the market here to raise capital in the U.S., and pretty quickly um, we were able to raise up a facility with uh, a, large loft, uh, a large hedge fund here in the U.S., uh, Fortress, uh, which I understand invests in, in, in other funders as well, um, and and we put together a $200 million facility for the next few years of our U.S. investments, which which hopefully will be just the first of, of many. Um, notwithstanding that, I get approached all the time by folks looking to find out if, if we have room for further investment in us. So, so to circle back to my, my initial response, the appetite seems large. Yeah, I would I would underscore the large um, Burford. Um, has now almost a billion dollars uh, under management in our public fund, and we recently um, acquired Gertz and Keller Capital, uh, which has over a billion dollars under management in a private fund structure. Um, and I think there is essentially a very large, I, I hesitate to say limitless, but a very, very large appetite for um, this capital, or sorry, this investment from particularly institutional investors. All of our main investors um, in the UK, where our fund is traded, are very large institutions um, and pension funds, um, and the same uh, is the same can be said for our LPs in our private fund. Um, there is just a, a tremendous, especially in this low interest rate environment, um, tremendous demand for the kind of uncorrelated returns that um, we've been able to provide for our investors. Um, and so, you know, we, we continue to provide funding. There are hedge funds and lots of other players out there looking to get in the space. I've tried to get poached recently by a hedge fund, I'm sure they called Dave too, uh, who wants to start up their own new fund. Um, and so there is a lot of interest in getting in here. And I think the bigger challenge is being able to scale, putting that kind of capital out um, quickly enough to accommodate the amount of capital that there is. Yeah, and just to underscore what Emily said, you know, the word on the street that we're all hearing is there are multiple hedge funds and money managers looking to stand up new mm -hmm. funds in the space. So we expect to probably see some competitors, more competitors yeah. coming down the pike shortly. Yep. I completely agree. Um, I actually have an interesting 
point of view on the capital side, both from the institutional side as well as the retail and general credit and investor point of view. So like the two of you just mentioned, we were also talking to a group of ultra high net worth family offices who wanted to guarantee us a half a billion dollar fund for commercial litigation and a more diverse strategy. Um, but I can tell you that Esquire Bank on their side has been actively pursued from institutional capital going. But Yield Street's a really interesting play. So Yield Street almost exclusively takes retail capital. Okay, and the types of investment opportunities and litigation itself that we have launched in the last number of months have been large portfolios of pre-settlement, law firm loans, complex commercial litigation with upside, um, receivable finance to law firms. Now, I will tell you a few quick uh, stats. So on December 29th, there was one deal for just under $20 million that was oversubscribed um, by 38 investors from New York to Hawaii in eight hours. There was a complex commercial litigation deal for $5 million that sold out in six hours about a month and a half ago. Last week, we had two pre-settlement offers, both in the $2 million range. One went in 120 seconds and one went in 110 seconds, both with over 50 people in it. So we have grown in investor size from customers in April of about 600 to about 12,000 today, all through digital marketing. And the general idea is that the investment process is completely seamless, which for the first time allows people at any size to come in. So you really get to see the appetite. And like Emily said, we're looking at an environment that's low interest rate. It's non-correlated returns. There's a huge mistrust in public markets today from individual investors. Uh, hedge fund performance is down. We're looking at people getting uncomfortable with where we are in the credit cycle today, where we are in real estate valuations today. And finally, over the last two, three years, there has been a lot more transparency into the litigation finance arena. So guys like us who are walking around touting the returns that we had in a very closed circuit environment, that's gotten out over time. There are more people that have opened up shops since then. So people have started to see, investors have started to see what this industry is and can now make heads or tails of it. Um, so I would say I agree, I, I, I couldn't say limitless, but um, I don't think there is any shortage of capital in this industry anytime. And I also don't think that like Jim mentioned before, I think we're in the second hour. There are going to be uses of litigation finance that none of us are going to expect over the next couple of years. So I'm excited to see where it goes. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of the, I'm the specialist here, so I have to answer my, I agree with everything that everyone else says, but in my own uh, practice area, things are, are a little bit different. I, I totally agree that there's, um, there's uh, a lot of demand for uh, investment in, um, even in my, in my asset collection funds, um, mostly due to a lack of correlation with the markets. Um, when markets are low, people look for a lack of correlation. When markets are toppy, they look for a lack of correlation. So it seems like in any environment, um, it doesn't seem too difficult to raise money. Um, collection risk is a little, um, uh, a little slower uh, of an investment to manage than uh, straight commercial disputes. So um, my uh, investors are um, either institutional or sort of high net worth reg D investors, um, but I, they're highly vetted. I, um, I only have um, 13 LPs because I, I, I need to know that they understand that uh, collection risk takes time, um, and so I need patient capital. And um, one of the concerns that I, that I might have about the industry as a whole is that um, usually whenever there is um, limitless appetite for investment, that means you get a lot of uh, different kinds of investors. And, Litigation funding is um, even, if you get lucky, is, is a slow burn at best. Um, and if, if what we call hot money starts to enter the market, it's going to get more complicated because um, it's an industry where you just can't guarantee short-term returns because you're susceptible to the, the whims of a court and, and um, these things just take time. Um, that said, I'd be curious to see, um, I also am, am very careful in vetting my investors because we have to deal with a lot of confidentiality issues. Um, you know, uh, litigation funding still has this uh, kind of veneer to it where, um, you know, people can file nuisance suits and, uh, and go after the funder. Um, that'll, I'm sure that'll come up in this in disclosure discussion that we will have later on. Um, but I also just need to know that my investors are, are comfortable with me uh, investing in claims without necessarily um, fully disclosing the nature of the claims. I know that's a, um, an issue that Burford had when they first went public in, um, in uh, Jersey because uh, it was, or sorry, it was Guernsey, right? Guernsey. Yeah, because, um, you know, they have reporting requirements for their investors, and, and rightfully so. Um, but um, it, it's difficult to be privy to uh, litigation um, 
and, and, and not have those concerns about confidentiality. Um, we don't want, uh, the claimants don't want their litigation strategy um, to be disclosed just because we happen to be funding it. Um, so I'm actually kind of curious how Yield Street deals with that whenever they're um, putting claims to the to the retail investors and how they get them comfortable with the claims without necessarily disclosing too much information. Sure. So I think that um, it goes back to the point of the demand and the desire to be invested in this asset class. Yield Street obviously can't go out and blast to the public world, hey, we're funding you know this specific case with this global law firm, et cetera. So what we've done is describe the nature of the cases and the suits and talk a little bit about the character and general biographical information of the firm. So we would say, hey, it's a top 20 firm in the world. They're doing you know, 10 cases like so. It's fraud recovery or it's complex litigation. Uh, small company suing big company because big company you know, lied and stole and cheated, et cetera. And we tried to give information, but we never disclosed specific plaintiffs. Um, in those cases. With regards to mass tort litigation or some other you know, law firm type of litigation, we may say, hey, we're investing in a law firm. We're providing capital to a law firm that has a large um, book of business across seven litigations, uh, TVM, yes, et cetera, and walk them through what the general litigation is um, without being specific to plaintiffs or necessarily the law firm. And I think that um, that was kind of a really big learning curve for us at Yield Street, understanding really the right measure of curation to give to your investors. I think Burford does a great job. I actually, the other day, finally got a, around to reading the annual report. And while you don't necessarily have to go and speak about the individual case, the giving a, a, your investors a sense of comfort that there's a level of transparency, that you're explaining to them what's happening is really what's key. I don't think there are more than five of my investors who, if I said to them it was case A or case B, would know the difference and that would make a material um, difference to them in investing the case unless they have a personal connection to the defendant necessarily. Thank you. Let's let's do turn to go ahead. Sorry, just again, maybe you mean to say somebody what you're selling is sharing litigation risk. Is that right? Yeah. I mean you're selling Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, yeah, and I think, you know, the difference between what Burford and, and Bentham and Drumcliffe do and what Yield Street is doing is that when you invest, when an investor invests in a share of Burford stock, you are investing across a very large and deep pool of varied litigations um, in jurisdictions across the world. Um, and I think what Yield Street is doing is providing um, a much more specific litigation pool or single litigation that a, an investor can sort of pick and choose what they want to be invested in. Of course, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to move on to that next so thank you for the for the segue i would uh before that um just want to circle back on some of the um disclosure developments uh that are are coming up i think both from a governmental perspective as well as between the actual party in litigation and the funder and so first there have been a number of states that have enacted laws which require the disclosure of third-party funding. Uh, and the sense is that's to try to limit those types of cases, presumably. What's your view on where that jurisprudence and legislation is heading? 
and do you see a groundswell of, of, of an effort to try to limit third party funding of litigation or is the evolution of litigation funding into supporting those companies that you would typically see as defendants a hedge on that? Uh, well, I guess um, I would, uh, you know, I think there is an overwhelming trend in states across the country, except for some very limited um, small jurisdictions, uh, in favor of allowing litigation funding um, and um, that there really isn't, a, by and large, any kind of groundswell of uh, movement towards regulation of it. There is some discussion about whether um, there should be disclosure, just like there's disclosure of insurance policies under the federal rules, so that judges can assess um, whether they have a conflict in, um, in deciding a case. Um, I think it would be an odd thing for a judge to own stock in Burford, but you know, clearly there should be uh, you know, the purpose that we have in, in, in the U.S. And, for and disclosure. The canons prevent them yes. from doing so, actually. Exactly. Um, uh, you know, around disclosure, both of, of insurance, of, uh, you know, of, of equity holdings of a certain amount in, in companies to courts, is for courts to make sure that they are impartial. And we draw lines around that. Um, there are some movements for there to be disclosure of litigation funding too. I personally have no objection to that as long as we also have protection that there isn't a you know uh, you know sideshow of and delay of litigation trying to discover communications between funders and litigants. You know there has been and we haven't touched on it yet, but overwhelmingly uh, strong jurisprudence developed across the country um, around providing work product protection for those communications. Um, so in general, I think overwhelmingly there is movement towards getting rid of old Champerty statutes and allowing litigation funding um, and um, you know, disclosure issues I think will, will come up and um, you know, I think it's appropriate uh, to allow courts to assess and you know, to draw some lines around what must be disclosed for courts to determine whether they have an, influ an improper um, uh, conflict of interest in overseeing a case. Do you see that um, outside the United States uh, as a developing area as well, or was, were the, is the jurisprudence in those other countries that you all operate in um, different in this regard? Um, well, there's certainly a lot of activity around this right now in the international arbitration space. Um, the IBA just promulgated new rules that touch on uh, disclosure for arbitrators. It's a little bit different in the arbitration context where arbitrators are also practitioners or still partners of law firms in many cases that um, litigate cases. Um, but there's, there's activity there. I think in the UK, um, litigation funding is just, it's a matter of course, it's not really a big deal. Um, and is just you know what there are fee applications at the end and disclosure of funding and a after the event insurance is part of that yeah I, I would really echo most of what uh, Emily said I mean at Bentham we really do believe in transparency when our, our parent company um, you know started off in the industry in Australia 16 17 years ago made a decision to disclose all of the uh, matters that they funded and the terms that they were funding under when we came to the US, we took the opposite tack, basically just because of the way the discovery regime operates here, and we didn't want to get embroiled in satellite uh, litigations uh, here over uh, correspondence that was sent back and forth to, uh, to the funder and what the terms of the funding agreement would be, which would potentially ratchet up the cost of the underlying litigation and perhaps make the funding impractical to begin with. And if a balance can be struck between, um, between the issues of, of what gets disclosed, then, then we don't really have a problem with you know, coming out of the shadows and being disclosed. As a general rule, though, we stay in the background right now uh, unless there's an agreement uh, with the client and the lawyer to come out of the shadows because of the discovery regime here. Now, it can be beneficial to disclose that a funder is involved in a case to the underlying uh, case itself because it can be a nice leverage point in the case, actually. So we're, we're happy to come out of the shadows if, if we can be assured that it's not going to ratchet up uh, the costs in a case. On the state level, I would just mention that um, what we've seen mostly is uh, targeted legislation to protect consumers, um, and often that legislation will impose rate caps, which if they were to apply to our cases, we wouldn't be able to fund those cases because of how risky they are. We seek high returns in our cases. 
Um, and we don't fund a whole heck of a lot of consumers. Some of our funding does bleed into consumer funding, uh, where we might fund an individual in a whistleblower case or a high net worth individual who has a complex commercial claim. But most of our funding, to answer an earlier question that you had, really goes to small, mid-size, and large businesses. Um, so we're not really funding consumers, and that's been the target of most of the state legislation. What's been on the forefront recently is, you may have seen the Northern District of California uh, enacted a rule requiring that any funding of a class action uh, firm, uh, a firm that, that is litigating a class action case and might be getting funding, needs to disclose that to the court. And, and I would submit that that's because there's some unique uh, issues with respect to class actions as opposed to other general uh, commercial cases and that provision has now been picked up in the recent uh, class action bill that, that passed the House of Representatives on a, on a party line vote. Uh, and you know, we'll see what happens to it in the Senate. But, but there is a difference, I think, between class actions and, and general commercial litigations. Um, I don't have a fully developed thought. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. Yeah. Uh, my issue is it's kind of a, an interesting issue. The transparency side of it, we're totally fine with, very much like mm -hmm. the both of you said. Personally, I think there's a lot of posturing. I don't, I don't understand why we're moving away from the merits of cases and focusing on the financing relationship. We're business people. We're here to make money. If we can't make money, we probably won't fund that case, or at least we think we'll make money. Um, the idea of creating a ton of noise around litigation finance, um, listen, our returns are in public. Look at Burford's, right? They do really well. I don't think they're funding. I don't think there's like a section in the new business development that says let's fund bad cases. Um, it just doesn't make any sense. So I'm a little challenged to understand why, you know, they're pushing legislation like this. I think um, similar to what, what David said, if I stand up and say, hey, I have $10 million behind this case, be sure that I did a ton of due diligence, more diligence than any of you will probably consider doing by a number of people. So I feel very strongly about that case. So do you really want to make that public? Is that something defense counsel wants to know going into it? Is it something that helps the case? Does it hurt the case? I'm not entirely sure where the thinking in general is going with regards to financing cases. But I think more importantly, it can hurt the people that don't get litigation finance, whether they need it or not. If the thinking becomes that cases that have a financial partner that has deep pockets that could withstand a long litigation, then maybe you ought to think twice before you do that, whereas the, the cases and plaintiffs that don't have that financial partner don't necessarily mean they don't have a claim that's as meritorious. Maybe they don't want to give up or share in the risk because they think it's a simple claim. So I think it's, I'm a little bit challenged by the necessity for it and the point. The transparency issue I'm totally fine with, but I don't want to see U.S. litigation start deviating from where we're supposed to be, which is in court and working on the merits of cases and wrongdoings that have happened. I think that by and large, the plaintiff bar is really the only one holding you know, fraudsters or corporate wrongdoers feet to the fire, and I think that's important. Um, but that's where I'm yeah. up to in my yeah. thoughts. Totally agree. I was going to say that there's been a push recently by uh, certain constituencies to, to amend the federal rules to make uh, any funding uh, to, if you have funding to make it an automatic disclosure in your initial disclosures like you would have to do with an insurance contract. And uh, while in some senses funding is the mirror image of insurance on the plaintiff's side, it, the, the analogy for why you need to disclose the insurance policy doesn't really hold. You know, there you want to know whether your case should keep going or not if you might not have sort of the pot of gold of the insurance contract on the other side. It doesn't really hold the same way that the defendant needs to know whether the plaintiff is funded or not, whether he's going to go forward or not. The defendant has to go forward one way or the other, and it shouldn't be the case that a defendant uh, only you know, gets to win if they have the deep, or it shouldn't be only be the case that the deeper pocket you know, gets to win. A case should really be decided on its merits. The other thing I would- The funny thing is that if an insurance company wouldn't exist or there wouldn't be capital to pay a claim, then that would, I wouldn't necessarily be a frivolous lawsuit by merit, but it would be a very large waste of time of court and lawyers because there'd be no money at the end of the case. That's so right. right. It's kind That's of right. the opposite direction, right? Right. That's right. And the final point I would just make is courts already have the tools that they need uh, if there's a reason to disclose uh, the existence of a funder. There's going to be a panel tomorrow talking about the, the ACE case, for example, where you know, the, the court uh, you know, compelled the disclosure uh, of the funder's involvement. So there really doesn't need to be additional rules enacted mm -hmm. uh, in order to get at that question if it's relevant in a particular case. Sorry, I, have my, I, I kind of have my own views on this. Um, in the space in which I deal, um, it's actually uh, sort of 
negative for my own personal safety to disclose the fact that we're investing in, the, in certain litigation just because um, a lot of the people who we go up against uh, for collection risk are people who uh, in one way or another are sort of sociopathic and um, I think if they were able to find about, out about the disclosure of a funder behind a claimant they would use uh, any means that they uh, that they could to frustrate that uh, that litigation. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm I'm susceptible to what the market forces are. But in my own, from for my own funds strategy, uh, disclosure isn't necessarily a great thing for me. Um, I also I, I take kind of a temporal view of the of of this kind of disclosure concept, where I, I feel that when litigation funding was in its first hour, um, that the requirements for disclosure of of financing for um, for litigants was really used by defense counsel to frustrate litigation. That's my view of it. Um, and I think that as the market matures, it's gonna have this sort of uh, deleterious effect of um, having those, sim those people uh, getting what they wish for. And like you said, finding out that now that, these, that litigation funds are larger and that they have um, um, a lot more capital under management, um, that the disclosure requirements are actually going to show that while a, a plaintiff, you know, his or herself might not necessarily have a lot of financial resources, if the funder behind them has, um, you know, almost limitless financial resources, then uh, that's not going to, it's not going to help to try to frustrate the litigation because uh, they're going to have a, a really serious funder behind them and they can't, as we say, they can't bigfoot the plaintiff and just try to outspend them. So I, I think it will make the market more efficient um, if there are disclosure requirements. Thank you. Thing I would We're, say is that you know, what's interesting is major corporate firms always had substantial lines of credit, right? Yeah. So if you're whoever, just name one, or say you're Reed Smith and you have a $100 million line of credit from Wells Fargo or whatever, Thank for regular America. purposes, is that is that now a disclosure? It's always been that way. I don't know if yeah. you do, but That's right. I'm just curious why it's different when it comes to how do you even differentiate between a traditional line of operating credit and something that we do if we're giving a law firm loan, mm -hmm. right? To steal a line from one of your new colleagues, right. you know, all cases are really financed in some way from yeah. the corporate treasury or a line of credit um, or, uh, you know, a, a shareholder. So this is just another way of financing cases that doesn't really call for a separate set of, of rules That's and regulations. Right. Right. There, I mean, the, in many common law and even civil law jurisdictions, there has still in existing um, the, the concept of, of champerty, which had been an old English um, rule. Um, we've seen Hong Kong and Singapore both recently in the last few years move away from those um, rules and recognize that um, the ability to finance a litigation, whether a litigation funder or any other third party that provides capital, should be allowed because parties just don't have the ability to, to bring a case and, and obtain justice through the courts like there should be. So mm -hmm. we're seeing not only in the U.S., I said earlier, a, a move away from those old champerty doctrines, but also in, in jurisdictions around the world. Right. And actually, Emily, that comes back to that earlier question, too, where, um, you know, one of the tenets of champerty was that the, 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 a third party would be controlling the litigation. And I think I could probably speak for all of us that while our underwriting standards are um, very stringent, once we invest in a case, we, we are not controlling the litigation. I mean, we might um, have, I, I kind of say I, I, I have suggestions, and, and a lot of times, in, um, at least in my field, I have uh, claimants who come to me who really need some suggestions because they don't know how to hire specialized asset recovery counsel, they don't know how to hire international counsel, and so they might look to us to um, suggest it. But we, we don't uh, call balls and strikes on, on litigation, so I, I don't think we'd really run up against chamber concerns anyway. Mm -hmm. Jim, thank you for that because that was the place where, because of time, I, I wanted to end and to address this gentleman's um, question is, is where does the control start or end or not exist in terms of the cases or matters that you invest in. Um, and so we heard from you, Jim, thank you. Does anyone have a different view as to 
the level of involvement um, or direction you have in a, in a particular matter? Our business is in every level betting on the jockey. So whether it's the pre-settlement business, investing alongside a firm that has a long-standing track record, if it's investing alongside another commercial litigation funder, it's the diligence that they've done. If it's providing a loan to a law firm, it's because we think that that law firm has the right track record and the ability to continue to be successful. So in every case, in every investment, with regards to the legal business that I've invested in, I've had zero say whatsoever. Like Jim said, once the money's in, it's in. So we don't, we don't, I mean, we get updates on the, the, the general success or lack thereof in a particular investment, but we have absolutely no say and never even, frankly, been interested in it. I'm not a lawyer. I don't have a law background. I'm a finance guy. So for me, it's we run our process, we do our diligence. If we feel comfortable that this is the right investment to be made, then we take it from there. Similar, we, we are all former trial lawyers at, at Bentham with, with 15 years or more of trial experience, so we do like to think we have something in the way to offer in the way of thoughts on the best way uh, to get the case across the goal line, but it's completely advisory. It's a take it or leave it kind of thing. Most of our uh, lawyers and clients that we work with like to take us up on the notion of, of thinking through some strategy questions for with us because it's often useful to have someone who's, who's not as emotionally invested as the client or is not as deep in the weeds as the day-to-day -day lawyer think about the best way to, to get to the end game in a case. But we don't take any control. We disclaim any control in our contract, as I believe some of our uh, other colleagues up here do as well. The only rights that we have after we invest in a case really are the right to be kept informed of what's going on in the case on a regular basis, kind of like you would do with an insurer on the defense side. The right to be kept appraised in as real time as possible of what's going on with settlement discussions and be allowed to weigh in with our views, and the right to be paid the, the, the return that we contracted for, but ultimately all the strategic decisions in the case are left to the lawyer and the client. Yeah. So Burford has the same approach on our litigation funding. Um, investments um, but I will say look um, it's legal to buy and sell claims lots of places and Burford has a very large and public uh, claim that we have um, bought a majority interest in and have control over and in fact have made a secondary market offering that you know has been incredibly successful um, and so um, you know while in, in most litigation certainly where we are litig you know providing capital for a claimant or providing capital for a law firm to, to do a litigation um, we are we are passive in exactly the way my colleagues up here have described um, there are investments out there where we have either purchased the claim outright or purchased um, majority of the claim and right to um, to prosecute to run the the litigation. Um, so that that is out there. That's happening. I mean, we're you know there are a lot of bankruptcy lawyers in this room. Claims are auctioned off in bankruptcies all the time. Um, so that you know that is an area where where we are, and I would expect to see a lot more activity um, by professional um, investors. Thank you. Um, because of the prior panels going over time, we need to uh, wrap up and. Uh, I'm hopeful this terrific uh, group of panelists will be at the cocktail hour this evening um, where they can answer any further questions you might have in this really exciting and, and fast developing space. But for now, if we can just thank them all for appearing, it certainly was very illuminating.